Hey guys, it's Sam and it's the moment you've all been waiting for. It's my Clockwork Princess spoilery discussion. So as I said, this video will have spoilers, so if you haven't read this book, go ahead and check out my spoiler free review, which is linked on the screen. So we'll just go kind of in order here with this. First off, let's just start with the whole Lightwood Worm situation. <laughs> like, I I didn't think that that was going to happen, and it's just so over the top and crazy, but I'm excited because it brought, like, Gabriel fully into the fold and, like, he needed to be out of there and he's a brat and whatever, but, like... <laughs> Ridiculous. Like, your dad turns into a giant demon worm. Great. Great. I don't like how there are multiple female characters within this series that are just horrible, insufferable brats and don't have much more dimension to them. Between the Lightwood sister and Jessamine, like, I don't like that and how it's done. Like, yes, you can make mean girl characters or, like, Girls, like, girls are multidimensional and they can be multidimensional. The thing about these girls is they aren't multidimensional, they're flat. And I don't, I don't like that. Like, just don't make mean girl characters just to make them. Like, we had years of mean girl characters being villains in books, particularly in, like, YA books and stuff. Like, I just, I just don't really need to see it and it just feels, like, really easy to be like, let's make this, like, stuffy girl the, like, a little side antagonist thing. It's like, no, it's really boring. Like, it, you can make girls be mean girls while making them like complex characters. So for example, I really am mad that Jessamine was so fucking pointless. Like, okay, she's just around to be a brat in like the first book and then she dies in this book and then she comes back for a second as a ghost at the end to like talk to Will. Why? Why was she even in there? Like, I was hoping she would, like, overcome everything and, like, turn into, like, a badass or something or whatever. And she does- she's pointless! She's pointless! And it's just like, why even put her in there? Why even have her? Like, what? And I still don't quite understand the whole Will Herondale can see ghosts thing. Like, it's just, like, dropped in there and then it's like, but only when it's convenient. Like, we're not gonna explore this and maybe you guys will tell me, I'm sure. There's probably some Mortal Instruments character that can like see ghosts and it's like a thing so it was dropped into here as like a little thing for that. I don't know, but it's like if you're gonna have like a cool like ghost talking seeing ability, like can you do more with it than buy drugs and talk to Jessamine for 30 seconds in the whole series? Speaking of little side antagonists, I wasn't expecting Consul Wayland to be a douche. And he was! And I'm like I thought you were a sweet little old man! And look at this, causing problems, making up lies. And that's another thing too, is like, okay, between like the mean girls and then like the misogynistic guys that like, don't like women. And I'm just like, we have a few of those. Like we have like him and Benedict, and I know it's like the time period, but you also have the Shadowhunters supposedly being like, a little more enlightened. So it's kind of like, I know you're doing it for the time period, but at the same time it's just kind of like, you could, you could do more, like, you could make them a little different, you know? Like, you could have it, instead of just all these male characters that, like, don't like women, you can do something else to make them more interesting. So I do notice a trend, and I've also heard people say that, like, Cassie does have- I hate that I like call her Cassie now, but she, like, has a tendency to just kind of regurgitate tropes of characters. A lot of people say that Jace is apparently a lot like Will Herondale, that there she just does these kinds of certain tropey characters and maybe that's just one of her things that she does but it's kind of like give them some more complexity man make them really interesting but i will say for interesting characters we have sweet bb magnus bane and like i knew before i went into this series that i was gonna love him and i loved him like in the first book so like it wasn't that wasn't a problem but even in this book he's like with them and he's helping them and he's doing the portal and him and like Henry are friends and all that and he like loves Will Herondale and like a sweet like platonic I want to help this poor BB way and Tessa goes and finds him we'll talk about this later but like Tessa goes and finds him later and like is you know she like lives with him for a while because she's all sad and like just having him around makes me so happy it just makes me so happy i might read the bane chronicles maybe because of him because he's so great i just love that he's like their little warlock friend i just love him he's just a sweet baby and he just wants to help them and he's sad because he's seen a lot of loved ones die over the years and he has wisdom to share with like tessa because she'll have to do the same thing and it's just oh let's go into all of the feels that i have for this love triangle so 
Hair and Gray Stairs is my OTP. That's who I love. I love them as a OT3. They are my forever OT3. I wanted them to be in a canon polyamorous relationship and just be happy all together and that was stolen from me and I'm very upset about it. But I love that the fandom pretty much agrees with this, that like, for a while there I always heard like, Wessa was like the OTP of everybody, but I feel like everyone's come around over time to be like, the OT3 is, is the only real pairing of this series, like if we're being honest. All of them together in love. I don't really ship either of the side parts of the triangle. I said that within my last review for Clockwork Prince. I've never just really shipped either side. Like I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, when they're all t when they're like together. But I ship the angst and all of the lines of like they all love each other and they are trying not to hurt each other, but by loving each other they hurt each other and all of that. That's what I was here for. That's what I signed up for, that's what I'm always here for, and that's what I searched on Tumblr after finishing this series, which is I wanted to see all of the OT3 stuff. And I was justly rewarded. So when Jem is like getting sicker and sicker, because my theory was that him and Tessa were going to get married and then he was going to die and then she would be with Will, like a very like Pearl Harbor-y type situation. So when he's dying, I was like, what? And then when Will's like rune starts bleeding and he like knows he's dead, but then we didn't get like a funeral, we didn't get like anything for him, we didn't get to see his body, and I was like, I don't believe that anybody is dead until I see their bodies in fantasy and sci-fi. And I need to see them like burned. Like I, people can always come back, you cannot fool me, I know that there's something going on if you don't have anyone seeing the bodies and anything like that. So I kind of had like a suspicion, but at the same time his like rune bleeding was like, Maybe he is dead, and that, if they did, if he did die, what a horrible send-off, Cassie, and how dare you do that to my precious gem, and all this stuff. But I was still, like, holding out hope. So when he gets revealed as being Brother Zachariah or whatever, I was super surprised. So blown away, didn't know anything, didn't suspect anything, anything like that. I have heard from people who've read the Mortal Instruments first, and I know some people are going to be like, well, if you read them in publication order, this wouldn't have happened, blah, blah, blah. Mm, nah, nah. But I've heard some people say that you can kind of semi get spoiled for things in the Infernal Devices if you read the Mortal Instruments because Brother Zachariah is in that series. And you kind of know from the end of this that he is because he talks about some stuff and being like, I'll tell you the story sometime or whatever. So that was a huge surprise. And I was like, Jan! <laughs> it was so good. And all the, just the, the drums with all of that makes me so happy so happy like oh my god but yeah it just it just hurt me and just I love Jem and something that I really love about Jem that I didn't really think about until I was done with it is I really appreciate Jem's kind of like disability rep stuff going on like especially with like disease so I do not I've never read a lot of books that have characters especially in fantasy who have some kind of illness this is a little bit different because I know it's like an addiction type thing and whatever but I still appreciate it how he responded to things, how he was like, I want to live my life the way I want to live it, and how people around him didn't understand that. That happens a lot with people with like treatments and stuff, and people being like, I can't understand why you're not doing this treatment, and not realizing that like that person doesn't want to live a half-life just to be around longer. And this is particularly with cancer specifically, but that happens with a lot of other diseases as well. So... I really appreciated seeing that on the page. Like that really spoke to me in a lot of ways. Like that made me very, very happy. So a lot of the things that Jem represents as far as like living with a chronic condition, chronic disease, debilitating disease that needs some kind of like treatment associated with it, I really liked seeing. And we do kind of have like a magical cure thing, but not really, it didn't bother me in the way that it might bother me in other stories because it wasn't like an instant cure. It happened like hundreds of years later and like, in this case it was like an addiction based thing so that made more sense than having like another kind of disease so it didn't bother me i feel like you had to still like you know 300 years yeah there could be cures for diseases we have right now that could be cured in 300 years so it didn't bother me like having that kind of almost magical cure thing because i feel like it was a cure that you really kind of had to fight for and time had to just pass in order for that to happen so we'll get back to the ot3 stuff but the whole plot of this book i felt like wasn't very strong which is kind of really sad i did like all the twist things like with the reveal of tessa's family and how she's part shadow hunter and thank god and like yay and all that stuff and how she's related to that other family the name i'm forgetting right now and all of that stuff but I feel like the villain just never really lived up to his potential. I think that villain could have been so great and he just really wasn't. You know, he fell off a lot in the second book and then by this book I just was like, 
You could have been so much more. Like, he had a whole demon robot army. And nothing comes of it. Like, yeah, we get that great scene with Tessa turning into a fucking angel and just ruining everything and it being awesome and her, like, squishing him in her hand. Like, that's great. But it's like, when that happened, I was like, is that it? Like, is that it with the villain? Like, we're done. And we, I had, like, 150 pages left. And I was like, we're done with the villain? We're done with the villain. Like, I thought for sure, like, maybe the robot army would be able to, like, rise up still with all, like, the demons or whatever. And then that didn't happen. I'm like... What a lame build-up! Like, you build up for all this stuff and then nothing happens with it. Like, that sucks. And I just didn't buy his motives. Like, yeah, these Shadowhunters did these things. Like, the specific family of Shadowhunters, like, killed your parents. Okay. And he did kind of target them, but then overall he wants to target, like, all these Shadowhunters. And I'm like, I feel like this kind of vengeance would have run cold a while ago. Like, you would have kind of burnt out, like, steam to do this over so many years. Like... I just feel like it wasn't really believable for me and it just made him, like, I didn't really understand his motivations and how he felt he was doing the right thing. Like, he was just doing it for vengeance and that's kind of a lame plot line for me personally. Like, I love a good vengeance plot, but it has to be, like, swift vengeance, not, like, over this long a time and targeting so many people. Like, if you want to target a specific family, like, if he was just trying to kill that family, fine, but he was trying to kill, like, every Shadowhunter and I'm like, that's a little widespread. <laughs> so when that happened, I was like, okay, we're just gonna get all wrapped up and stuff. And I kind of didn't like how the last couple of chapters, not the epilogue, but like the last couple of chapters really just wrap things up easily with everybody. Like, okay, so everyone's gonna be fine now and like everything's fine and everyone gets together. All the straights get together. It's one of those book series that like I love it because I do kind of ship like everybody. At the same time, I'm like, between this and Sarah J Maas, like, do all the straights have to get together? Like, do- does everybody in the friend group have to get together? No. No. And I've asked people and they're like, Cassie does that and like all of her series. I'm just like, yes, friend groups and her date sometimes, but like, not everybody gets paired up perfectly with everybody else. Like, come on. My favorite of the sides are Sophie and Gideon. I still don't know how I feel about, um, the Herondale girl whose name I'm forgetting and Gabriel. Like, that's fine. I guess, you know? But, like, the, Gideon and... and so, the, yeah, I love them. And obviously I love, like, Henry and Charlotte and stuff like that. But, yeah, just everyone getting matched up perfectly and everything just working out perfectly was kind of like... Okay. So we will talk about the epilogue. I did really like the epilogue. Everyone was like, you're gonna cry, you're gonna cry. That. I didn't really... I teared up. Like, the saddest moments for me were the Will and Jem moments. Okay, so anything, like anything in the book with Will and Jem was like what actually made me cry. None of the stuff with the ships made me cry at all. Like it was all the stuff with Will and Jem. So like when they had to say goodbye before Jem goes back to be a silent brother, oh my god, that like hurt me. And then in the epilogue when Jem comes back as a silent brother and plays his violin at Will's funeral, I died. Like that was so, oh my god, like it just, it makes me so v emotional and I was, yeah, I teared up. Like, I, I just love their relationship so much. And it makes me so sad that they couldn't just all be together, like, when they were all alive and everything, like, ugh, it makes me so upset. So that was just tragic. Like, when Will died, I wasn't, like, I don't mourn over Will Herondale the way that everybody else does. Like, it, like, okay. It, it is kind of weird that, like, he doesn't outlive, like, Charlotte and them, but whatever, okay. So, that was kind of weird. That's like, how did he only live to be like, what, in the 70s or something? But whatever. So then Tess has to go be sad for like a long time. She goes and gets Magnus, like I mentioned earlier, and all this stuff, and she's just so sad and everything. And then on the bridge, on the bridge, she gets to see Jem. And he's all back to being his normal self. And I was so excited. Like, oh my god. I wasn't expecting that. I thought they were just gonna like meet up, obviously. And he doesn't know that, like, they, that she still loves him and he's, like, counted on the days since the time he last kissed her and just, like, ah. That ship stuff I really appreciate, even though, like I said, I, I generally just ship the whole love triangle. But that stuff I appreciate it because I just want Tessa to be happy and she was, like, all upset for so long. And then she, like, gets to be with both the loves of her life, which is just, again, kind of too perfect. A little bit too perfect. Like, I will admit that. That's between, like, the plot just kind of wrapping up too easily and this part wrapping up a little bit too perfectly. That's kind of why I knocked off half a star rating from it. But 
it's still like, oh, it gives me a lot of feelings. Like, they just get to be together, and then I just, I kind of, like, I had this flash. There's was part of the scene, like, the epilogue scene, where she almost is picturing herself as, like, herself back in the day in, like, Victorian London or whatever, and I pictured the scene from Titanic at the end when Rose, like, dies and goes back as her you know, younger self and sees everybody how they were, which makes me cry every time I see Titanic. And I've seen Titanic like 150 times, probably more than that. So like I could turn on that scene and, you know, walk in on, on like TNT and start crying. Like it's, so that's what I was picturing. I was like, they get to be together. And I pictured like if they ever had like a movie or a show, like when that happens of like them turning, holding hands or something. And then it like, you know, fading into like them back when they were, you know, like younger, even though Tessa looks the same, but back during that time period. <laughs> oh my god! I just really want to see this in on screen and it's not gonna happen! Like, it's it's not. It's not. We might get flashbacks and like the Shadowhunter show or whatever, but we're not gonna get like actual dedicated stuff with them and it makes me so mad. I want a whole series, like a spinoff series, about this because I really want to see it on screen because it's so angsty and there's so many good side characters and all this stuff. So, yeah. Like, the stuff with, with Jem and Will and their love for each other made me the most sad. Like, again, when, when Will did, like, the dagger in the ground when he thought Jem was dead and all this stuff, like, that's great. And I just, I do like how it turned out. Like, I do like that they get to be together. And I'm still really sad for when Jem eventually dies and Tess is all alone again with Magnus, <laughs> who knows what it's like. Like, no, like that makes me very upset and hopefully it like never happens and they can figure out a way to make like Gemma Moral 2 or something and she'll be fine. Because I don't want her to be alone without the loves of her life. It makes me really sad. So I gave Clockwork Princess 4.5 out of 5 stars. So comment down below and let me know what you thought of Clockwork Princess. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all guys soon. Bye.